Uh, where do we start? Let's if we start with England, Fiji, are we starting there? Because it wasn't the best game of the weekend. The best game was certainly either the Springboks absolutely pulling the All Blacks pants down or France pulling Eddie Jones and Australia's pants down. But let's go. Let's let's talk Fiji because it's been a lot of doom and gloom around England. Um, somebody on this podcast last week sang things could only get better. Well, they didn't, did they, ladies and gentlemen? They got a lot worse. We were abysmal. But let's talk about Fiji. How good? You know, Jim spoke on here a few weeks ago about, I don't know if it's specifically about Fiji, but it was about the the kind of South Sea Island teams, your Tongas, your Samoas, your Fijis, who are going to the World Cup with loads of players who um, are world-class players in their own right. But it's always about the scrum the game management and the set piece where they've perhaps struggled because they have an offloading game. They all do. They have big ball carriers, you know, huge runners that can get through the contact, over the contact, round the contact. Um, but their set piece, Fiji set piece, we know they've got their offloading game and it was ridiculous at times. And their power runners, Semi Randrandra, looked like he was playing against a school team at times when he's getting the ball. Um, but their game management and their set piece which has been something that Fiji and rugby has probably lacked in previous years, looked in tip-top shape. And, you know, Matavesi, friend of the show, uh, Hooker, he's got the sidestep out, the Fijian goose. Um, he's left Theo Dan clutching at straws a bit. The whole game, they looked in control. Um, and we should make this more about Fiji being outstanding and Fiji are going to put 30 points on Wales at the World Cup. More so than England. Andrew, look at you. You're doing the Steve Borthwick thing here. So no one wants to dig into England now. It's oh, so weird how to? it's changed. Do you want me to? You can do, but I love that. It's, this is all about Fiji. This is like, as in Steve Borthwick after. And again, we can maybe get into that. But yeah, it is all about Fiji. I am being a, a, a bit of a, a, a joker when I kind of flip it because we do want to try and keep it positive. But I do love how... Your first line is is positivity. Let's keep it all about Fiji. Do you not want to talk about the social Sorry. media posts? Do you not want to talk about Marcus Smith's post where he's on his haunches after? It's all about him. Even though it's about Courtney Laws's 100th cap and it's all about Fiji. And the one picture on his social media is him down on his haunches. And I love Marcus Smith. I love social media and content. But it's all, it's just all warped at the minute. Look at me. Well, I'm being stuff, negative. A lot of that stuff's all created by the people though, isn't it? It's not... The, the lads putting it out themselves, they've got social media managers and stuff like that that do it all for them. But yeah, I mean, oh, I, 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 I just say it. I just said, I told you so. I told you so. I've been banging on about how dull England have been under Steve Borthwick and credit to the Fijians. And I saw on the morning on Dolo's post saying he's fed up of seeing the doom and gloom around England. Now about giving Fiji a G up. So basically, Nemzi was messaging me and Fiji, you're amazing. And that's a respectful thing, right? They've beaten England for the first time ever at Twickenham. So you, you start with the positives around Fiji and rugby. Such a big thing for them. You know, it's the first time England have ever lost to a tier two nation. Um, but yeah, if we're going into the depths of England, woeful. But I sang it last week. So I don't know whether to sing it again, that things can only get better, but they certainly got a lot worse. And and there's so many underlying issues with it. There's You mentioned this social media posts, Ellis Genge and Joe Marler coming up people. Part of me kind of likes that because it shows we actually have got a set of bollocks, but we just haven't got them on the field at the minute. Um, I'm watching the game. We're losing to Fiji. And let's rewind it. We started really well. So let, let's start with a few positives. The shape for the first 10 minutes, you've got Manu barging over the game line. Lawrence was going well. We played at pace. Our rock speed was good. There was width and shape in attack for 10 minutes. And then the rain came and we just didn't have a clue. It was, I said it on social media, it was woeful, absolutely woeful. There was no energy, no desire. Yes, it's a warm-up game. You're playing Fiji at Twickenham with a half-empty stadium um, and you're not getting up for the game. It's Courtney Laws' 100th game, 100th cap. He's captain. The players should have been desperate to show desire and energy um, and we just kicked the ball away. Fucking kick it in 22. Hopefully it gets a, a try. And people came back at me and went, well, we did. We got a try from a chip. No, no, that was back from near the 10 metre line. So we, we're dull, really dull for 70 minutes. Discipline was poor. 
Um, there didn't seem to be a massive amount of energy in terms of... Actually, you mentioned Marcus Smith. He's the only one that looked passionate about playing for England. And sometimes that spills over into too much in some people's eyes. But when he came on, that looked like a, a willingness to up the tempo, up the pace. But we're playing in... It looked like a game from the... When we've got the ball from the 90s that was really slow, cumbersome. Boys didn't look fit enough to play at a tempo or an energy that all the other teams seem to be doing. And yeah, the weather played a, a bit of a factor, but I, I don't know what we've been doing for eight weeks because we're not, we don't look fit. We don't look sharp. We can't catch. Our attack looks looked half decent for 10 minutes and then just fell apart. There's pictures coming up on social media of huge opportunities. And I've been there as a 10. Sometimes you can't see the space you need your second receiver to give you, you know, be your eyes and ears and talk about the shape. And Marcus Smith was trying to do that. He's screaming for the ball once after Alex Mitchell makes a break down the touchline, makes about a 20, 25 metre break down the touchline. All the Fijian defences condensed into, you know, within half the width of the pitch. We've got numbers to play out the back and wide. Every other team in the world, and I'm watching France at the weekend, and you know, even Australia to a certain extent, um, South Africa, you know, Scotland, when they're in the second half, they're putting shape, they're putting width on. England have got nothing at the minute and it hurts. And then you've got people coming out, and I mentioned it last week, I've been blocked by Joe Marler, which I didn't know about until someone screenshotted me the picture. Um, and, you know, it seems like they're, I don't know, it's backs against the wall, but it's basically, fuck you lot, we ain't bothered what any fans or pundits or anyone thinks, which is a positive at times, because it can go completely the other way where they think they're the best in the world because we both smoke up their arse. Well, we can't do that at the minute. The All Blacks do that for themselves about their team, don't they, Andy Rowe? Jeff Wilson, what are you on about? Um, <laughs> but I don't know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hugely frustrated, um, as every England fan is. It's very difficult to see any positives the coaching team, and I, I tweeted about it, about a million and a half quid it cost to probably sack Eddie Jones. That's about half a million quid, which I think was the right thing. But then you've got, you spent a million quid getting Steve Borthwick, who's had, what's he had, two and a half years coaching, head coaching experience. Kevin Sinfield, and we love Kev Sinfield, an unbelievable human being. Our defence is shocking at the minute. Um, and he's had two years, two and a half years maybe of rugby union coaching experience and Richard Wigglesworth. And Wiggy's a mate of mine um, and he's running the attack. Well, where is it? You know, he's only had a few years of coaching experience. So you look at Bill Sweeney, who got a pay rise. Um, and while all that was going on, I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed at how, what bad shape England rugby's in from the top. And then you go layer upon layer. You talk about the premiership clubs that have gone. You talk about the differences between the, the grassroots game and what the RFU did. Um, and the game in England, and I hate to be so negative, I'm just being honest and I get messages on social media saying, you know, stick to your guns and say what you think. And I also get messages going, you need to support everyone more. Why do you support anything at the minute when it's really bad? Yes, I want England to win, but my God, it's difficult. And, you know, I, I don't know. What, what do you see, Jim? Do you see any difference to what I'm saying? Because uh, it's woeful. Genuinely, I wanted to see it differently and be positive about what England could do. I obviously know a lot of the lads in that team as well. Ellis Genge, who for me, in his pomp, was in the top three to five loose heads in his position in the world with his power, the way that he carried. We've bigged up Theo Dan, uh, that he could be a bolter coming into the World Cup. Well, he has been. Uh, Dan Cole as well. We've had our ups and downs with Coley. I played with Coley. You know, Maro Toji, we know about Maro, Oli Chesum. Where is Maro? I mean, Where is Maro? Well, I, this is what I mean. I just don't know. He's not been the same since he had this illness or whatever came out that said he wasn't feeling well. He's just not the same player. He isn't. like. And as harsh as that sounds, and if he picks up on this or if people see that, unfortunately, yes, we have to give our opinion on it. You've asked me and he's nowhere near. He's nowhere near where he was before. And then you can go down the list of that. Like Ben Earl, I thought, played okay again. Courtney Law is 100 caps. How fit is he? He's always holding his neck. Is he fully conditioned? Is his body okay? 
And then you look into the mix as well, like George Ford, great deputant for Owen Farrell when he's at, when he's injured. You've questioned whether or not his test match quality, you know, mm. would it have happened if Faz was in there? I don't really know. Manu Tuolangi, like, was just non-existent. When he plays, normally when he's got the bit between the teeth, he's unstoppable. You know, Freddie Stewart, we've said, one of the best 15s in the world. So, you know, ultimately when you look at it, like, you're right, as in you can't, do anything but state the obvious. And I've tried to be positive about it. I think it's important for the World Cup that you've got a good England team. Yes, there's going to be stories and narratives around different teams, whatever. And this is all about Fiji and we will get on to them in a minute. You know, these lads are paid 20, 25 grand a game. And when I said it's a sh- that Fiji have shaken the rugby world, yeah. not that people didn't see this coming. We didn't think it was coming. So if you would have said, right, put a bet on, or put your house on it. Who's going to win? You've got to choose one team. You would have said England. You would yeah. have said England before the game. You would have said Fiji are much better. Power athletes. You look at their team. They'll give it a go. But this is England at home. They're not playing very well. They need a spark. It would have been against Fiji. They would have scrubbed them off the park. They would have mauled them off the park. They would have been too physical for them. And they weren't. Like Fiji looked completely comfortable in that game. And when I yeah. say that it shocked the rugby world... I was texting Simon Rao Louis, friend of the show, who's general manager, but he's coaching the team now as my well. Old skipper, mate, my, my old skipper. Mate, your old skipper. So I, I, and naturally, just say congratulations. And I wanted to be a bit nosy. And I suppose it was a personal thing that I asked. I said, how much have the lads paid for that game, for that test match at the weekend? Because, it's a, because again, this is sport, right? It's, it's entertainment and the lads are paid. It's professional. They're paid to play. The Fijians didn't get paid. They don't get paid for that game. They get an nominal, and wow. I won't share what the number is, they get an nominal daily allowance to play in that game. So when I say Fiji have shot the rugby world, you're up against lads. And yes, there's players in the Fiji team that we know that you, you've got a million pound player in Semi Randra. But I'm just talking about a snapshot of that. These lads are paid 20 grand a game. It could be more. I don't know what it is now. It might have changed. It used to it's be 25 less, grand. It, it's a bit less because it's wrapped up in a World Cup package, but it's still a lot okay. of cash. Exactly. So it's a lot of money, whatever they get paid. So even if it's 10 grand a game, all right? And that's the output that you see. And you have to yeah. call it how it is. Like This is all about Fiji. They've shaken the rugby world because they're going into a World Cup now in the world rankings ahead of England. Above England. But, but that's what I mean. Like, as in, if that's not shaking things up, we're talking about a team that were in the final of the World Cup four yeah. years ago. Yeah. This is England at home. So... People are saying, oh, it's not shaking. I saw it coming. I saw this. Well, why is it fucking trending all over? Why is everyone talking about it all over the world if it hasn't shaken the rugby world? So for me, it's all about Fiji. Love the way they play. They're an absolute horror to play against. The power. Look at Semi sitting down, Max Malins. Like, there ain't much Max can do. He tried tried his best, didn't he? Bless him. He put his head down. You know, he could go high, but he's not allowed to go high. I'd have run out the way. Well, this is what I mean. Take the High, low, silver lining. Exactly. Just hit the deck. You fainted. Something happened. You passed out. <laughs> HIA, you're going off. So, yes. I, and this is what I mean. I don't know whether that result is going to make it more difficult for Fiji because now, like as in, you are looking at that game first up if you're Wales, thinking we need to be at the level of playing in New Zealand, playing in South Africa, that kind of emotional state that you get to when you're playing the very biggest teams of France in the world to beat Fiji. You need to be physically, mentally, you're not going to scrum them off the park now. Their line out's going to be a lot better. But what are this Fiji team? There's a, there's a saying, right, in UFC and boxing, where if you become a champion, a world champion, in your next fight, because that doubt is no longer there, you're 20% better because yeah. you know how good you really are. And that's the thing with Fiji. I'm looking at that. We've seen them on the seventh circuit. We always said, we spoke about on here, if they click, they are going to be one of the, well, they've got the best athletes. That's for sure. They have got the best rugby athletes walking the planet, mm. bar none. Yeah, yes, Samoan, Tongans, absolutely. But Fijians with the speed, the power, the ball skills that they've got, if they can put it all together with a scrub and a line out, they are, well, it shows you with the world rankings, they're now above England. And yeah. that wasn't a fluke at the weekend, albeit we are shocked in a way. And the funny thing is, it's not, it's not funny, but good luck Wales, good luck Australia, good luck Georgia. They didn't even have their, probably their best two players in Lavani Bottier 
and Joshua Tuasova as well. So add those two in the mix. Mm. Wow. Um, but just to, you know, we've got to name check some of the players. Taggy at tight head prop, and you, you talked about it. If you, you can get parity or you can get some sort of balance there at scrum time. He ain't moving for anyone, is he, in the scrum? Um, he was outstanding. Caleb Munts at 10. Um, you know, there was a bit of a uh, hysteria in some parts around Ben Vola Vola not getting picked and missing out on the squad. But Munts at 10 just ran the game really well. I think Lamani at nine caused him a bit of trouble and he got hooked off early in the second half. Lamani looks great at nine in broken play, but in terms of game management, it's probably not his strongest kind of suit at nine. But Munts at 10, goal kick him. You know, top tier goal kicking that is that's world class in terms of how he operated game management, playing in the rain. When you've got Fijians that just want to go, hey, yeah, bro, give me the ball, yeah, offload, yeah, yeah, cuz, <laughs> you know how they are. He's got to manage all that expectation of semi just give him the eyebrows and then, you know, also have a plan around game management. And Simon Raul Louis gets that as coach because he's played in. Europe for a long time, obviously, he was involved with stuff from, so he gets game management and he's tagged on certain things since your old mate, since your old mate Stern Byrne left. But what happened to Stern Byrne? Politics, I reckon. Rabbits? Mate, no, I, it could have been rabbits, but they obviously <laughs> eat rabbits in Fiji, so that's not a problem. Maybe the shaking hands and then he's called someone out and they've come towards him. Because as we know, the Fijians, the loveliest yeah. guys ever we had the late Sir Rambini and we used to drink carva with him on the floor can you imagine the carver session on Saturday night after the Fiji beat England at Twickers unreal yeah I mean I've had that I've I've had carver out the the tea towel and I am hallucinating <laughs> like a morphal <laughs> your lips go but then mate should we go you want to go with a big name you go with a big name go with uh, go Ravatu Manda again. go on then there we go not, not bad Ravu Tawamanda. Ravu Tawamanda. Yeah. And, and start, Naifa Levu. Yeah, Naifa Levu. Naifa Levu. That's yeah. what I said. I got that one. And he, I played against him. He's that old and that good. I played against him back in, geez, when would it have been? 2014, I think he was at Stade Francais, playing against Wasps. And he absolutely rinsed Elliot Daly on the outside. Um, but you talk about Ravu Tawamanda on the wing. He starts off, he's had a shocker. Johnny May gets the fend out in his chest, which looked like a really easy try. And I'm like, hey, this is going to be good for England. Like maybe the Fijians aren't all the way up for it. He ends up getting man of the match. He steps and rinsed Johnny May back, didn't he, for his try. Um, and they just looked world class in everything they do. They're offloading game in the wet. We know how good it is. And I'm thinking when the rain comes down, this is now England's to take control. But you forget. There was a video posted ages ago, wasn't there, about yeah, I was going to say Fijians yeah. training in a monsoon and just loving it, offloading everywhere still. So the weather didn't suit England. It actually made England go into their shell even further, if that is possible. Um, and credit to Fiji. You know, they are, if anyone didn't think they're a dangerous outfit before, well, the whole world's looking at them now. Um, and you can only wax lyrical about how big that is for them. And when you put it into perspective around the politics of cash and what they have to do to play for their country, uh, you see that in spades for them where for England, you're like, I'm not going to say some of them just rocking up for the paycheck. Some of them are just trying to get through that game to get to a World Cup, whereas the Fijians were desperate to win it. Um, and it was a massive difference in desire, effort, skill level, intensity, willingness to fight for the jersey. And England need to pull something out of the hat, whether that's a rabbit that Jim can flick round and end up cutting the skin off went on Scotland camp with Sternburn or whatever, but Steve Borthwick needs to do something because Argentina have gone around there to World Cup preparations quietly. Uh, Michael Cech is sounding confident and, you know, England are uh, facing a very tough group now. I mentioned Chile on Twitter. I said, I'm out. I can't even see us beating Chile. That was a bit of a joke, but Samoa as well. Jeez, we might not even finish third in the group at this rate. Before we get on to that, the, is this the weekend you think that showed that the gap between the so-called <clears throat> Tier 2 nations and the established superpowers is closed? Yes. I'm going to say it. I think there's three yes. tiers. Yeah. At the minute, uh, and sorry to interrupt you, 
I think there's three tiers because you saw South Africa, how great they were. France on a different planet. Ireland, okay, it was a bit of a mixed performance um, and there was a few change of players, but stand up and watch Samoa, stand up and watch Fiji, Georgia in the first half against Scotland and Scotland went to town on them in the second half. Don't get me wrong, but the gap has certainly closed and that's what's going to make this the most exciting World Cup. And the gap has grown massively between South Africa and New Zealand as well, eh, Andy Rowe? <laughs> but just on that as well, I think, look, there's a couple of parts to this. You look at Talalaya Tupo's comments after the... The French game, where I actually thought Australia did all right, to be fair. Uh, I could see really? what they were trying to do. You, yeah, look at their game plan. Unbelievable in the air. Look at their the unbelievable. Yeah, I know. But I, yeah, they, but you could see the kind of game plan that they had and the power that they had when Will Skelton was carrying, etc. But he said that they're holding back for the World Cup. Scotland as well in the first half against Georgia, they go 6-0 down. All Borthwick keeps talking about is Argentina first game. Now, I've played in these World Cup warm-up matches. I'm not saying that you are holding back, but I can tell you now, you are not all guns blazing like South Africa and New Zealand were on Friday neat. You're just not, as in people might hate to hear that, but and it shows you the gap now if you are slightly off in terms of the development of your Samoas we saw that against Ireland. But that's Ireland, right? That's the number one team in the world and yeah. there's four points in it. So I think there is an element of that. I, I, I'm with Borthwick on the fact that we'll be judging these teams on the World Cup and these games will be long forgotten. Sorry, Fiji, it maybe won't be. Maybe not. But it is hard, isn't it? Like I have, I've played in these games before. It is, they are tough to get yourself up for, especially if you're up against a Georgia who every single game is the biggest game of their lives. Fiji, the same. Samoa, the same. Do you know what I mean? Like they, it is. It is a different feel for these teams than it will be for the teams that are perceived to go into the semis and the finals or they think that that's the expectation. Yeah, yeah. It is a tough balance, but you can only judge it on what you see as well, James. And look at you, exactly. Borthwick's best mate because he got you to Saracens. But I'm not, I think it, I think he's like a rabbit in the headlights. When I see him, you see after the press conference, he's completely gone to his shell. And then they yeah. go to Courtney and it's like, you, you've got to give something. You have to give the fans something to follow. Something. Like, if that was me, I'd be flipping tables. Like, look at John Fury at the press conference. Pod, 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 pod. Rugby pod. 